which goes like that. Share my screen. Hello ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another interview and today I'm really pleased that uh, Morgan Studdick, I hope that's pronounced correctly, it's almost as bad as my name and <laughs> you know I'm so used to Morgan being pronounced wrong, it's lovely to see other names. So um, welcome on board and uh, thank you very much for agreeing to take part. Well thank you, it's uh, nice to be invited. Uh, yeah. So um, I know a little bit about you. Um, I've, obviously, I've had various bits of music in my collection that I've listened to over the years. But um, I'd like to sort of, I'd like to start by asking about your own musical heritage. Do you come from a musical family? Yeah, I would say that I do. Um, I'm a fourth generation Salvationist, and uh, and people have been in, involved in band and and stuff. Um, um, my mother's side is on, from the Soviet Army, my dad's not, but uh, uh, both my brother, sister and mother is in the band here in Ashim. Uh, so we are involved, I would say. <laughs> mm -hmm. so, so you got a lovely, uh, so um, when did you sort of discover that um, music was a passion in your life? Was it growing up in the core and with the family? Was there always music about? Yeah, um, yes, <laughs> that's the short uh, answer. Um, again, band has been a big part of uh, our life, and uh, and I must say that uh, even my even if my dad's not army, he, um, I gained some musical influence from from him as well. Um, yeah. So, um. When did you sort of find out that composition and writing music was something you could do that other people could take part in and do outside of your own bedroom, your own study, your own living room? Yeah, I've always been uh, fascinated by, you know, people writing. Uh, I took piano lessons when I was a kid and um, I remember one afternoon my mom was, uh, she was going out shopping and I was home alone. And I found this uh, manuscript paper and starting, started writing. And then when she came back, I showed it to her. And yeah, so, so I think that is my first memory of, you know, putting something down. Um, later on, we, we, um, we formed a quintet uh, at our core. Mm -hmm. um, and I wrote some stuff for, for that group. And uh, yeah. So, so very much kind of at an early stage you're aware that music was something that had a profound interest on you yeah, yeah. yes and um, I, was, I was looking at your um, cv online and most of it's scan brass in norway and you've got a few other pieces i mean i think we played yeah. um follow i will follow thee mm -hmm. um not too long ago but your first published piece that i can see is abide with me back in 2004 which is a yeah. long tune arrangement. But, yeah, uh, so true. when did you do, you know, who was the first group that sort of done a bit of music by you outside of your family that you sort of were brave enough to show somebody else and say, I've been doing this, <laughs> um, you know, would you mind having a, a rundown? Do you remember that? Yeah, I was, I was um, conducting a contest band and I was, I remember I, I always had this thought that I want to be a composer and I want to write, but there was a time there where, where I felt that I couldn't do it. <laughs> so so uh, I, I brought an arrangement on Deep Harmony. Yeah. To, really yeah. And, um, <laughs> and my thought was, okay, either this will work or I'm, I'm not doing this. Uh, and <laughs> I remember on the train back 
home. It was almost like a, a prayer answer. Like, yeah. Okay. yeah. Okay, yeah. So I'm supposed to do this. <laughs> so, so, so were, yeah. you, were you used to conducting ensembles and musical groups before you started putting compositions on the stand? Well, I've been very lucky to, to be able to bring stuff at rehearsal. Uh, I think the rest of the band got, you know, annoyed with that, but, uh, <laughs> but, uh, but, it was, <laughs> but that's the, I think that's the way to do it. You have to, you have to hear what you're doing to learn. So I'm in retrospect, very grateful for, for that. Did you, st uh, did you start out as a pen and paper composer? Yes, definitely. And, uh, uh, after a while, I, I got the finale program, and uh, you know, I, I thought it was fun to play around with that. But uh, pen and paper has always been uh, important for me. I mean, as you say, you started out writing arrangements, and you've got a lot, a lot of lovely hymn tune arrangements published. Mm -hmm. So, how do you mean? I mean, one of the things I like to ask is originality. You, you've said you've deep harmony and abide with me, and so forth very familiar tunes that yeah. have been covered by more how how do you try to maintain an original take on a hymn tune arrangement using a familiar tune well um <laughs> hopefully by not overthinking it much um uh, hopefully my musical language um, is original <laughs> mm -hmm. so so, so I think that if you stay true to yourself and uh, what you want to do, um, that's uh, that's the best thing, or that's the best way to do it. Uh, I think no, if you if you if you li if you live your life trying to be original, uh, I don't think that will work out well. <laughs> so, who are your um? I don't know what the word mentors the the people that you looked up to as you were learning to compose and sort of you know learning to go down and improve you know was there anybody who sort of crossed your path that was of a great encouragement to you and that really sort of what we call a mentor are there any yeah, people that definitely you know when when I was around 12 or 13 I live here next time. oh a lovely day Yes. Yeah, he moved to to Ashim and became my bandmaster, and he's he's a really good friend. I've, I I talk with him every day, um, so he's my uh, Mister Miyagi, I would say. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So so we 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 talk a lot lot about um, stuff, not always music, but uh, but. Um, um, yeah, he's, he's he's been great. He's a good friend, and uh, he, you know he he still writes mm -hmm. yeah. uh, really good music, and uh, yeah, it's an inspiration to see that. Is there any kind of um, type of music that you uh, really enjoy writing? I mean, do you, I mean, you, you we have the prayerful, we have devotional. We have what I think a lot of composers say is the functional march, mm. snappy, uh, swing kind of arrangement. Is there one that really one particular kind of music that appeals to you as a writer? Yeah, I'm, I've written a lot of marches uh, lately, so I, I guess Ooh, interesting. <laughs> yeah, um, uh, but uh, you know the hymn tunes and uh, the, the the calm stuff is. Um, close to my heart, I think. I think that is what I do uh, best. Um, but, but to write a good march, to, to, to write a good melody, um, you know, is uh, something I'll, I think uh, appeals to me. Yeah. Is yeah. it, so, when you, you get these music, is it mostly people kind of ring you up or send you an email saying, can you write something and commission you or mm -hmm. is it a case of uh, it's a it's sort of a 50 50 split between your own inspiration and people emailing you 
it's an it's equal balance is that what you would find <laughs> yeah it's it's funny because I, I try to make a living out of this and so so the times when <laughs> uh, it's quiet I get to write what I want mm -hmm. but then um, the money won't come in <laughs> so so uh, but uh, when when I have commissions you know, I, li I like that because uh, it's a challenge um, uh, so that happens it's, yeah yeah I would say it's 50 50 mm -hmm. uh, I, I, I conduct uh, a lot and um, so I try to write arrangements for groups I conduct so uh, yeah yeah um who are the other um i mean you see be you, you play in army groups so obviously you get a lot of army music that comes from mm. all around the world so are there any particular names that spring to mind that you really enjoy playing and you love the opportunity to study some of these historical scores i mean obviously you mentioned um elif who is legendary but mm. uh, are, th are there any kind of names that spring to mind from you know outside of uh Elif, that you've enjoyed looking at the scores and thinking that's a you know I really enjoyed playing that. Yeah, I mean, when when you brought up army, there are all these names. Um, being a Scandinavian, I would uh, definitely mention Leitzen and Söderström mm -hmm. and um, and Bruce Broden has been. Mm -hmm big inspiration yeah um, of course Kenneth Downey with his uh, timbre you know it's it, yeah I like uh, yeah and and uh, and also Dean Goffin I would say um, interesting um, not uh, a name that's come up much well, no I mean I like uh, good craftsmanship and he was uh, one of one of the best, I think. I mean, when, we, when, we, when we're talking army, I would say Dean Goffin and Bruce Broughton is perhaps uh, the most. Uh, Inca yeah, it's interesting. Yeah, I, I agree. I think Dean Goffin is just, I think he's almost forgotten about apart from some of his most famous works. Mm -hmm. And you, once you've got like um, Symphony of Thanksgiving, old and he, Tilney Hall out of the way you know yeah. there's a lot of work there that and I think a lot of composers have said his craft his writing is just spot on yeah so, um yeah I, I was I mean you, you've even ventured into the Christmas market which <laughs> I think a lot of computers you know either do reluctantly or they don't I mean I think a newborn hope uh, yeah. 2008 which is a I don't know yeah. if you it sounds to me I may have played it down, but um, how do you it's handle a, the Christmas aspect? Because obviously it, the culture of Christmas get, differs from one country to another. So yeah. your your take on what a traditional Christmas music would be would be different to Australia, would be different to my hometown in England. So mm -hmm. how do you you know what would be a, sort of a taste of your Christmas program? If you're having to write something for the Christmas program, what what would that involve? Well, <laughs> it's a strange season because, uh, at least for us, uh, it's uh, not a season you play a lot um, at the core. <laughs> so, so to so to write a Christmas piece uh, is like investing a lot of time in something that won't be played much um, but about that march uh, um, London Citadel Band was the first um, mm -hmm. or band that I you know liked and they had a CD called Excelsior where uh, Bruce Broughton had a piece on called Covenant yeah and I fell in love with the CD and that piece, and I think it's a gorgeous piece. Yeah, it's strange because I think <laughs> it's almost a bit embarrassing actually. But, but that piece or that CD was is part of the reason I wanted wanted to write because 
Yeah, I'm, yeah, because I'm really into I'm really into film and film music and yeah. and, I, and I was like, okay, if, if we could do that in the Salvation Army to combine those things, I want to do that. And uh, many years later, I befriended uh, someone called Serena Doors, and uh, she's a uh, leader for the Timberwolf Group in uh, yeah. Uh, London. Yeah, and she. Yeah, Ask, she over, yeah, she came over to the yeah. Congress, I think. She went to yeah. go to the Congress, I saw them. Yeah. Yeah. And she asked me to write that Christmas march for, for a big thing they do. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, interesting. Yeah. So when the London Citadel played that march, I felt almost like the circle was ended. Yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah. It's, really interesting. <laughs> it's interesting because I said we were having um, a discussion early this year in my core and he said, you know, after the, um, because this was back in early January, and the co officer said, look, I'd really love to nail down and get some little arrangements going, he said, and to play some Christmas marches before mm -hmm. the, the summer holidays. So when we come back, not knowing that the lockdown was going to hit, mm -hmm. that we would have something in it. And I said, yes, please, but make sure we're not playing Christmas Joy. <laughs> I said, I can think I can do that blindfolded. Yeah. And half the band who, like myself, had played it again. So it's always nice to see a new Christmas march that's, you know, traditional and has got that sense of hope in. And um, yeah. it's wonderful. Um, it's always interesting to try and um, differentiate between genres. But mm -hmm. calling it solos... I can only find <laughs> one, Jesus yeah. Loved Me, um, which is what, 2011, it was published in the American Band Journal. So it, is that just a fluke of that's the only one being published, or do you just not like Cornet Solos? No, I, I play the Cornet myself, so... Um, oh, that's why you don't want them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. no, so I, I wrote it for myself, actually, because uh, Ashim Band, my core band, we went to Newfoundland, and um, I was um, asked to play a solo, so I wrote I wrote it for myself. Yeah, and and I love the, and I love the melody. I think uh, I think uh, Ray Boves is a composer people should talk more about. Yes, one of my favorites in the scene company was his arrangement. It doesn't so rarely gets heard these days. But um, that actually brings me to another point because I was listening, I was going through my playlist and you've got a, I don't know whether it's the official title, but I think someone on YouTube done a march of yours called Join the Salvation Army, which yeah. uses the John Larson version. Yeah. Uh, that it's got, uh, you know, that yeah. wasn't very often. People will go, joy, 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 and, that, and not they don't use what I would call the singing company version. But how did that get mixed in with the march? Was that a commission or what? No, I, um, that was uh, something I did, you know, for myself. I wanted to write a Unity Series march uh, that uh, would be appealing. And so as I used that Larson mm. melody, but I, a hint, uh, there's yeah. small hints of the other one there as well. Um, yeah, I think uh, being in a, the Ashim band is a small group. Um, they play good, but it's a small group. Uh, so, so, so I've been interested in writing um, good music for smaller groups. Mm -hmm. I think even though we write for five parts, we, we don't have to dumb it down. I mean, Beethoven wrote string quartets. You know, I mean, a quartet doesn't mean that it's bad. It just oh no 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 yeah you know, it's it's just a um, yeah. group. <laughs> so I think uh, that's something, <laughs> or for, for me at least, that's important to 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 try to always write quality music. Um, mm -hmm. I talked about uh, with uh, Robert Reddit about that. I met him at Halifax airport and we, we had a small chat and he he said that okay it's a lot harder to write for smaller groups than yeah. you know big the big bands but 
I, 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 yeah. Yeah. One one thing I, I kind of gets asked, depending on the composer, is how do you um, discipline yourself? Because if if you, as Robert Redden said, you can write for a the international staff band for a big concert, and it's almost the sky's the limit because there's no kind of limit on what the band can play because they've got the ability to have all the cornets, all the trombones. So mm -hmm. your musical palette is not restricted by saying, I've only got two cornets, one trombone, quintet. You've got everything, as we say, including the kitchen sink. So mm -hmm. when you're writing an original piece of music that's not, you know, got a particular band in mind, how do you maintain your structure to sort of keep it sensible and it's not just going to blow up in front of you? Well, I think it's important that no matter the group you have in front of you or the group you're writing for, you have to write idiomatic. Um, I mean, if I write a p, if if I would write a piece for the ISB or Eikanger or or the top bands, you know, um, yes, they are good, but but I wouldn't I wouldn't push the limit. Okay. I, I, I would I would still write idiomatic, because um, I think that if you if you if you keep pushing the limit all the time. It would, it will uh, affect the uh, presentation. They're, they're only humans, so mm -hmm. you know. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. So when you um, when you've got to sit down and you've got to start with the the blank piece of paper, what's the process you go for? Do you have to sort of put yourself away and cut yourself off from the radio and the TV and the internet? <laughs> and you know all the music we get in the shops and stuff and just sort of blank stuff out or does it you know what's your process for getting started and getting the notes on paper well uh, um I, I i can't sit and wait for for an idea to to pop up so so my thing is to it's kind of Okay, now I'm 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 going to work, and and now I'm done. <laughs> so it's very, um, it's not it's it sounds really unromantic, but um, um, it's a job, and it has to be done, and uh, hopefully sometimes uh, there will be something yeah. interesting in that. But uh, if I, I would. If my tactic would have been just to sit there and wait for it, it would never, uh, if it, it would never happen. You know. Um, sometimes uh, when I'm, you know, a good idea can pop up when I'm outside, and but but all in all, it's uh, hard work. I would say. Okay. <laughs> have you got a mobile phone full of? audio memos and yeah the, yeah but sometimes when i listen to it after i, I don't know what, what i was doing oh really oh that's interesting <laughs> yeah but, uh, yeah um obviously you've got this wide um variance and you're sort of happy to do whatever goes but was that always the sense of what you wanted to do when you were growing up was it to become a, a professional musician or was it a case of that just sort of took over when you found out that you could compose and music was really important to you? You didn't kind of want to, I don't know, be a scientist or, uh, you know, no. a film editor or whatever. Uh, no, for me, it's, uh, you know, playing the cornet, it's, it's, it's always been, you know, playing, conducting or, or writing. And these three things, have had different uh, strength, you know, uh, growing up. Um, but at one point, uh, composition uh, won. <laughs> and so, yeah. yeah. So, um, what lessons do you feel that you've learned yourself that 
really stand out in your mind as you've been um, maturing as a composer? Are there any kind of highlights that you can remember saying you're really grateful that came up? Or was it, you know, are there any kind of special memories that spring to mind and say that was a really important part of my career? Not that I can think of, but in general, the discovery of trying to keeping it simple. And when I say simple, I don't mean it in a in a negative way that it's yeah, straightforward. Be, but yeah, yeah, but you know, do a good job. Uh, sometimes I find it hard because you know, um, being a Salvation Army composer in some ways it's a bit different than being a <laughs> professional yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. the audience are different and um, <laughs> but at the same time there are some similarities but um, being speaking as a salvation army composer it's always been the receiver uh, that's been uh, my main po in my main focus so yeah yeah I, I do find it because i think some composers they have this ability to almost not worry about the religious element when they're not writing for an outside band because obviously if you're writing for something like the corey band or for the town brass band mm -hmm. it's not the expectation to have the religious content that a no. salvation army band would expect to have so when you, are you aware of the you know is there something that has to sort of stop inside you and say this can't have you know deep harmony in it if you're writing for an outside band do you ever have that or is it just a case of go with the flow <laughs> well uh, first of all <laughs> i think that uh, all music is a gift mm -hmm from God and um, so it's a part of me doesn't want to separate the two mm -hmm. uh, even though using a hymn or a song makes it uh, kind of more direct um, <laughs> if the receiver knows the words uh, yeah. that's something I, I think about a lot these days uh, if, if yeah. the people we are writing for today, uh, would it make a different difference if, 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 if they know, uh, mm -hmm. if yeah. know the text anyway? No. Yeah. So. I'm, I, I, I'm trying to remember, I, I listened to most of your music I had on, uh, rec on CD this afternoon so I could get a taste and there were some things mm. that I were immediately jumped out. I mean, I, I've, the Deep Harmony was one I listen mm -hmm. to it because but deep harmony is just a wonderful tune to begin with and that's a wonderful arrangement and i didn't realize to join the salvation army one in which we mentioned was yours and i said it's always nice when you look back and oh that's who wrote that i'll have to ask mm -hmm. you that um what piece called lift up yeah now, <laughs> yeah what can you tell us about lift up because some people will be scratching their heads on that one yeah i do do it myself it's a strange thing oh, or it's a maybe not strange because uh, Espen Ödgård who is the bandmaster of the Territorial Band uh, asked me for something funky and um, I thought okay I'll give it a give it a shot yeah and, um, people seem to to to, to like it um, and it uh, I hadn't thought about it for a while and but a couple of years ago, it just popped up on, uh, at a congress, <laughs> and I was like, okay. Uh, so it's. Is that, is that something that you don't really kind of sort of the swing? It's not your type. Yeah, of... I, I like. Yeah, I like. Um, <laughs> I do like yeah, jazz. Bearing in mind who your mentor is, Ed Herrickstad, who made his yeah. name with some of his wonderful pieces. Yeah, that's true. Um, well, you know, talking about I live and swing music and jazz, I, sometimes I think, um, I don't know how to put it, but if, that 
he's kind of misunderstood because um, for me I, I, I well I look at him as you have the light saying and he's kind of the next uh, generation and I in one way I think I feel that he's doing the same thing um, I think using jazz and swing in our context shouldn't always be 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 looked at as uh, just fun. I mean, uh, Duke Ellington wrote his uh, second concerts, uh, uh, and it's serious stuff, you know. It's yeah, yeah. Jazz, but so I've, sometimes when I listen to, for example, uh, I lives all to Jesus. Mm -hmm. Uh, I feel it's it's done to, uh, you know, tongue in cheek, mm -hmm. like it's, it's it's a serious piece of music yeah. written for uh, written written for a prayer meeting. Yes. So, yeah. There's de there's dedication in it because it's not yeah. a it's sort of a flippant piece. There's real artistry in the yeah. Um, it's written with a purpose, and uh, sometimes when I hear people play it now, I get a bit okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I'll go into um, one of the pieces I discovered um, by a reference from somebody else who recommended me listening to it. But mm -hmm. um, is there any pieces of music yourself that you've written that have gone out and been published? That you've had a, you know, you were surprised at where it got played, because we've had we've had people say like Romania and Zimbabwe, you know. Yeah, you, you mentioned you mentioned follow I will follow. I, I heard it was played in Japan, so I guess when you you make it in Japan, you you know. That's a lovely <laughs> place. Uh, I mean, the Japan staff band are really fighting the elements, so to kind of play that kind of, to be have that kind of music to hand and mm. to be blessed i think i think for so long within the army we were so used to having the music within our own country and our own territory that to have something from another country and another territory was almost unheard of or yeah you'd have to go abroad and then you brought it from the music department said look i brought mm. this back on holiday in the suitcase let's yeah. try it but yeah. um one of the things i was i really was pleasant surprised because it I lost it for a long time. Um, my dear friend Martin Cordner was right. Yeah. And he said, um, I call it really brave to do it because you took variations on a theme by Bramwell Coles. That yeah. is a weird, beautiful thing. Very <laughs> brave to take, as he said, one of the most famous and well loved choruses and completely turn it. But it works. Now, yeah. how? Yeah, I, I mean, I was just saying, I knew. <laughs> The thing was, I lost the title, and I was actually oh, okay. having lunch with John Larson. I said, "You know what?" He said, "He said, what's the matter, Morbid?" I said, "I've got this earworm of the world is needing us in a prayer mm. context," and he said, "How the heck do you put the word?" I said, "I don't know." I said, "If I hadn't have heard it, I wouldn't have known it. I wouldn't have associated it." And then I was speaking to Martin Cordner, and he said, mm. "Oh, that's Morgan's variations on the theme," and mm. I found I had it. And of course, how did that piece start? I mean, what's the story behind the variations on a theme? Why did, you know, I just find it interesting that you take a very wonderful chorus and re-spiritualize it in a way. Mm. Yeah, it's an, almost 10 years ago now, but uh, it was written for, for our core band, our 75th, 75th anniversary, and I live asked me to write something and again I, I wanted to write um, something good or you know serious mm -hmm. for our small group um, and that song is a song well known mm -hmm. here in Norway um, so it's it was just a something I choose to do, but, um, but I wanted to write a variation, uh, you know, not um, tra traditional variation, but I use fragments of the melody. Mm -hmm. so, so like variation, the first variation is 
from, from the first two bars, but but the second one is, you know, mm. in the middle of the song. Um, so so in a way, the listener can't really uh, tell that it, that it is a variation, but um, um, it's a different take on the variation. Very, it's a beautiful take. I think we just and yeah, again, you're you're lo it's a, a modern day comp composer using an old tune. I, are you a fan of these old Salvation Army melodies that we have in our heritage in our collection? Yeah, uh, or <laughs> at least I I uh, I liked I like the thought of being a, a part of part of that heritage. Um, and I think uh, some of those songs are uh, really, really good, and and says a lot about uh, or says a lot, lot of, lot of things that I can relate to. Um, when, when it comes to this variation piece, I did something that I I don't know if I've, I've done it before or after, but I sometimes have these um, almost like personal easter eggs in each mm. um, so like I have a score here um, so in the first variation in the score it's called uh, 1976 and people are like what, what's that all about <laughs> and uh, uh, and it's not about anything really but it's like I, I, I wanted to name each variation with what I felt immediately after writing it. And I felt like, for example, the first version reminded me of a 70s uh, TV show or, you know. Yeah. So I found out that Charlie's Angels first came out in 1976. <laughs> so I just called them. I was born. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. And the next movement is called, uh, It's called uh, Sergio and Ennio, being Sergio Leone and Ennio Morricone, because I felt that it, it almost sounded like a spaghetti western. So it, there's all these things that doesn't make any sense for <laughs> for the listener or the reader of the score, but for me it's um, almost like a um, like a notebook or a diary of what, yeah. what I was thinking writing it. So. Yeah. yeah. What no. is there a piece of, mu of your music that you constantly hear being referred to? That everyone says that's the Morgan, that's the, you know. <laughs> it's almost, it, or now I'm, I'm fine with it, but uh, a couple of years ago I was not, because people are always talking about Deep Harmony, which is the first piece. Um, and, it, and it's a really important piece to me actually because um, yeah what I said before and um, my my grand uncle used to be the bandmaster and he he always used that hymn as a warm-up um, so it's a really um, important piece to me but I, I would sometimes wish that okay let's <laughs> think about something else <laughs> I, think, yeah. Yeah, I, I just you know I was looking, I mean, you, you've got things like the Pathway of Duty, uh, Neo My God to Thee, you've got mm -hmm. a Rescue March. Um, I, I do love the, I can hope to pronounce the the uh, Norwegian version, but the, the English translation, I think, I can't keep quiet about Jesus. I think that's the yeah. way that you did. I, I love this, th this kind of brassy idea of I can't keep quiet about Jesus. Um, yeah. Oliver Arneson says on the list. Mm -hmm. that, I, that name is not familiar to me, I'm afraid. No, he he was actually from uh, Ashim, where I'm living. Uh, wrote a lot of songs that got really popular, and uh, um, so a lot of what I do uh, when it comes to Salvation Army music is to write. Uh, arrangements that uh, hopefully is appealing mm -hmm. and uh, at least in our core um, 
people like to sing along and you know so yeah. just to write something that uh, kind of it's almost band tune book but still a bit more you know mm-hmm. yeah, it's yeah. Good experiment yeah yeah and um, who are the other composers that um nowadays if the if the music comes on the stand that you enjoy playing and listening to as a salvationist as a musician so when you when you're not having to conduct and compose mm-hmm. and another you know whether they're no longer with it well preferably when they're with us who are the names <laughs> that sort of spring to mind as aha and they've written another piece have they you know i keep coming back to ken downey um you can't avoid Ken Downey, it's lovely, isn't it? Yeah, it's always, you know, when I was around, and, uh, and to me, I don't know if he would agree, but uh, for me, it seems like he's been on a journey himself, because I remember the pieces he wrote in the 90s, it's a bit different from, you know, in 2000, but it, it seems like he's kind of come back to, to, to the style Perhaps that that he, he did use in the nineties, and so so I'm so I'm so I am a fan again. <laughs> yeah, and yeah so, you know, like uh, uh, what what he writes for Unity series and what Bill Himes writes for Unity series just shows what you can, you know, do. Yeah, for for, for a small group. Um, and for those kind of um, levels of articulation, it's more functional and more likely to get used rather than writing a big piece, which may only get used when you have the sufficient number of players. Whereas if you're writing for Unity or for the instrumental series in the States or something, that because of the limited number of parts, it's probably more able for more bands to be able to play it because yeah. it's got that degree of playability. Mm. But I think I find it interesting because um, talking about craftsmanship and Dean Goffin, for example, uh, a smaller group can almost play one of his big pieces and it sounds okay. Mm-hmm. Same group can play, can find it hard to make a Unity series piece sound okay. So I think there's something about the quality of writing. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's important to yeah. bear in mind. His biography is, is a, a very interesting read because just the the mixture of um, exposure exposures to different kinds of music through his journey and through his travels just I think mm. impacted on him in a very unique way. But I think many composers will say the same. I said your your yeah. own upbringing and your musical knowledge and what you hear on a daily basis impacts you and helps to formulate your music so do you yeah. have do you have a particular favorite um salvation army song at the moment or does it change depending on what your mood is when you wake up i i don't i think um <laughs> i was thinking about that because like yeah blessed assurance has been a song that has been important in our family for generations. Mm-hmm. So I have a so I have a soft spot for that song. Uh, maybe it's just for that reason. I don't know, but uh, I think I would pick that one. Yeah. Um, I I looked at your um brass primarily, and it wasn't done deliberately. Um, mm-hmm. I, do you do vocal at all? Because I don't. I didn't have a chance to look at the vocal side. So. Are vocal composition something that you you do and just happy doing, or is it just primarily a brass composition? Uh, um, it's funny that you should ask, because for many years, I think <laughs> it's easy to get uh, pigeonholed in, in the army. And <laughs> so I, I went on a, as a leader on a camp, and I got to know some people and who were involved with uh, something called baby song here. I don't know what you call it, mm-hmm. but uh, like when mothers bring their children and sing yeah. songs for them. And uh, Army in Norway was really 
uh, invested in that uh, for many years. So, uh, so I, I wrote some new small tunes for that, and and through that, um, people realized that I could <laughs> do other things than brass as well. So that was nice. Yeah. So I've done I've done some of that. Yeah. So, yeah. so when, when you're not writing and having to sit down and write, what are your other interests? Do you, do you walk the dogs, painting, <laughs> you know, uh, playing football? What are your other interests apart from the, the musical landscape? Oh, I'm really into movies. Um, oh, lovely. Uh, mm, um, and, and football, movies and football. And, uh, you know, family is important. I have. Uh, two nieces who <laughs> oh, well, you got one so uh, so, so being an uncle is uh, important yes <laughs> yes I could yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'll show my niece that she'll laugh yeah yes yeah so what kind of movies do you like just out of curiosity um Vertigo is my favorite movie it... Vertigo oh okay yeah yeah I went, <laughs> this is a bit geeky, but I, I went to San Francisco in March just to... Uh, yes, I remember, the, I remember the tour guide. It was uh, brilliant. Uh, <laughs> so that was, um, you know, I, I turned 40 recently and that was the thing I wanted to oh, do. Oh, you! <laughs> Youngster! <laughs> uh, I don't feel that young, but thank you. <laughs> Well, I'm 43, so you're the mm. same age as my sister. So, and yeah, it's it's very interesting to talk. So, you know, when you were traveling, what, what did you notice about the cultural differences? Did you have the chance when you were in San Francisco to sort of go to any Salvation Army events? And, oh, um, yeah, I, I, I had, yeah, I wanted to, and I... Um, uh, but this was, you know, March. Uh, I wanted to go on a Sunday meeting, but it was closed, you know, because of the corona. And um, so that was a bit sad, because I, I would have liked to, you know, connect with the army there. But it um, didn't happen, I'm afraid. So, um, bearing in mind that we've had this lockdown, um, what has the, the challenges been to you in professionally and personally? Has it allowed you to sort of sit down and think and sort of get on with doing music or has it kind of been a rejiggling of what you'd normally do to what you can actually do? <laughs> I did get to, to write a couple of, you know, uh, big pieces. That's not often. Um, I have had this commission for a, something called the Brass Wind Festival in Bergen, uh, which is a contemporary music festival for, uh, for bands. Um, so I did get to finish that piece. Uh, and I wrote a variation piece on Sanden. Uh, oh. Yeah, Lead Kind of Light. Uh, yeah, so I did, uh, did get to write a lot. Um, I conduct uh, a couple of uh, choirs, and they, they, you know, that's that was a no go for a long time. Mm -hmm. um, but now things are slowly opening up, and um, so I'm happy about that. Yes, very much. Yeah. So. yeah. And do you have a favorite Bible quote, by verse of scripture? <laughs> yeah. You know, in, in um, getting older, <laughs> or in general, I've, I've become more and more aware that uh, Bible verses can be taken out of their context. Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. Uh, so... <laughs> Cherry-picked, cherry I call that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, or like, the so context has become important to me, and... Mm -hmm. It's like I'm more in more um, when it comes to the Bible. Uh, I'm more um, interested in who the Bible is uh, 
speaking about than 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 yeah. but, but but I do have one from that have followed me uh, from when I was young, and that's from Matthew six thirty three. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Um, Beautiful verse. Yeah, I like that one because it it, uh, it talks a bit about priorities and um, and I, in general in life, I think it's in, in important to be part of part of the world. Um, there are many stories about, you know, Christians <laughs> being almost locked down in the, in the church and almost a bit afraid of what's going on at the outside. Um, for me, it's important to be part of the world. Um, and, yeah. you're in, and of course, your influences and your experiences are a big part of that. And the fact that you have, you know, sections and people who are willing to support you in your writing and be that encouraged. And also, what a lot of people don't remember is to be the critic as well and say, Morgan, that doesn't work. Can we change that? Can we find out why? As if you can, you can try and emulate some of the best writers in the world, but mm. they'll always say, you know, you're always, there'll always be something that needs improving. You'll never be perfect the first time because there'll always be something that needs to be altered and to be refined because obviously the best is the best. So, um, it's yeah, and uh, yeah, you know, be, being part of, I mean, I, ha I heard a story about, you know, the years Eric Ball was out of the army mm -hmm. and, and the impact he had on, uh, on people. So I think uh, to be involved in groups outside church or army can be uh, can be a good thing. Yeah, it all helps the education, doesn't it? So, uh, mm. I'll, I'm I'm gonna if you, uh, pray for you now. Um, join in as you wish. Um, if you want to sit back and have a drink, feel free to do so. But um, I felt it's always very important that um, the concept of prayer is included. So you've you've freely volunteered your time. Um, I'm aware that although I, you know some people would say English isn't my first language, it's the only one I can speak, and I'm very grateful for you taking the time out to try and communicate in English. I know it's not necessarily something you do very often, but I appreciate you doing that, and that you know for some people it is a struggle to communicate with people on a daily basis. I'm not saying it is for you, but I thank you for taking the time and the commitment to do so. Um, I'm just going to pray with you now, so please, as you wish. Um, dear Lord, I just want to pray for Morgan now, that particularly in this time of lockdown and corona, that it just seems that the world is being tipped upside down and we've got to struggle like some kind of bauble that's been chucked around in the cardboard box and the compass is going anywhere but north. So we thank you, Lord, that you are a constant. We thank you, Lord, that you are there whenever we need you. And that when we need that question answered, when we need the answer to the burdens and the pressures of life, that we know that you are there beside us. I thank you for the gift of composition and music that you have blessed Morgan with and that all his experiences and the growing up and the, the exposure that he's had to all different cultures has brought him closer to you, Lord, and that the music that he prepares and rehearses and conducts is very much to make sure that the people benefit from it, that there's nothing worse than having a piece of music that just stagnates and goes nowhere but that you will bless it, Lord, and that, as the Bible says, nothing that is done in your name is wasted. So I thank you for his core folk, his mentors, his family, his friends. I thank you for their encouragement, not just in the positive ways, but 
when a bit of negativity is needed that sometimes the realization that something is not clicking something is not going right that it needs to go back take a step back to take a breath and just work out what's gone wrong and sometimes lord that's the hardest thing to do but we thank you lord that we can have your blessed assurance of the saving grace of jesus that is a constant and that as we've just celebrated pentecost and the coming of the holy spirit that it doesn't matter where we are in the world that you are there and that you are there to help and guide us and encourage us strengthen us and give us the battle that we need to the tools and the equipment and the processes to get through life but i just pray for morgan now i thank you for his music i thank you for his time his talent his dedication to you and i just thank you lord that he is so willing to follow you and to use all these skills to your glory and that other people will will benefit from it and will be blessed by it i just pray this now lord in your holy name amen right i will